Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm very, very excited to have Juan Felipe with us again. Uh, he has spoken at our events before, not in this format, but uh, I'm very excited to bring him back. Just to tell you a bit about uh, Juan Felipe, he is a faculty member at Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence, and his research is an overlap of condensed matter physics, quantum computing, and machine learning. And in a, a very interesting trend in his research, uh, at least for me, is the fact that he tries to really uh, understand how to use machine learning for solving condensed matter problems and quantum physics problems. Uh, and I always you know, have an eye out for his new publications uh, to invite him to speak. And recently, we also had one of his students speak uh, about using RNNs for quantum fu function measurements. So I'm very excited to have you here, Juan, today. Uh, just to give a little bit of a background uh, more about him, he previously was a, a research scienti scientist at DVAPE Systems, and before that, a uh, postdoctoral fellow at Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics, as well as uh, Penn State and Georgetown University. Uh, with that, uh, I pass it on to you, Juan. Uh, I know this is an overview talk, so we, we don't do our regular format of going through the concepts uh, to give you more time to go through all the con all the content that you have prepared. So please take it on. Uh, sounds good. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Amir, for the invitation. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here uh, with you. and. Um, as I uh, always say, this is an amazing uh, set of uh, series of talks and so on. I enjoy them very much, and so I'm always honored to, to be part of them. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about an uh, overview uh, of uh, machine learning for quantum matter. Uh, this is basically based on a review paper that I wrote recently at the beginning of the year. Um, and you can find it here. So it's Machine Learning for Quantum Matter, and it's published in Advances in Physics X. And it's uh, open access, so anyone can read it. Uh, so with that, let me uh, get started. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll start with uh, like a, a little bit of a definition of what quantum matter means, or what I mean by quantum matter. So it's very broad. So quantum matter uh, research uh, refers to the study of uh, multiple particle systems whose uh, description is intrinsically quantum mechanical. And uh, this is a very broad uh, uh, topic. Uh, and it has a lot of ingredients, but um, as I see it, it falls into the fields of uh, condensed matter physics with uh, strong connections and cross fertilization with other fields. So it's a very interdisciplinary um, um, uh, research area. So it um, brings uh, techniques and concepts from quantum information, lots of computational physics, quantum gravity, uh, uh, quantum chemistry, quantum information, uh, quantum computing more recently, and uh, even more recently, uh, machine learning. And uh, that part is what I want to discuss uh, today, or part of what I want to discuss is how is uh, this uh, interaction between quantum, uh, the study of quantum matter and, and machine learning research. And that has been summarized in this paper, as I was saying before. Um, so, uh, so there's this uh, machine learning for quantum science research happening right now, and this is a recent resurgence. So, where like the condensed matter, uh, quantum information, statistical physics, and atomic and optical physics communities are currently exploring research at the intersection between uh, machine learning and quantum physics. Um, the origin of this resurgence is uh, due in part to the success of deep learning basically starting with this uh, com uh, computer vision breakthroughs in 2012 by Jeffrey Hinton and his uh, um, collaborators and uh, the recent uh, success of uh, natural language processing and reinforcement learning. And um, what I want to argue here is that uh, this is shaped uh, in part uh, by the commonalities in the structure of the problems that this, um, I would say, seemingly unrelated fields attack. So basically, uh, there's a commonality in the uh, problems that we study in physics or in many, quite many body physics and uh, in machine learning. And so what I want to discuss in this talk is what are these commonalities or uh, beyond uh, asking what these are, uh, are we're, I'm interested in exploring, are they important, right? Like, uh, and can we exploit these commonalities to try to solve problems in, in quantum physics? Uh, 
and so what I will try to argue is uh, that uh, these commonalities are important and I'll provide examples of these commonalities and some applications of this ideas in machine learning applied to uh, uh, quantum many body physics and statistical mechanics uh, that people have developed uh, in the recent years. Mm. So the first commonality and the most uh, obvious one is uh, high dimensionality. So then uh, people usually start talking about uh, high dimensionality in this way. Like, for instance, you can imagine uh, you have a camera and then you can ask the question, how many different pictures can you uh, can you take with this camera? Right. And so we will consider the simplest uh, camera you can think of, which is a camera with uh, L by L pixels. Uh, the camera can only take binary images and each pixel can be either zero or one. So here we have uh, such uh, image taken with uh, such camera. Uh, where some pixels are white and some other ones are black. And so you represent that um, uh, in this array, like with these pixels, which are zero and for white and one for black. And so that's one one of these uh, pictures we can take. But how how many can we take? Uh, so you can count. Uh, you can build the camera pixel by pixel, right? So the first pixel can be either zero or one. And so that's two different values. And then you bring an, yet another pixel, the second one, and that can be either 0 or 1. And so the combinations of the two first pixels are 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1. And so that gives you four different combinations, which is 2 to the 2. If you add a, a, a third pixel, then you'll have more combinations. Right? You'll have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, and so on, all the way through 1, 1, 1. And that's uh, 2 to the 3 possible combinations. So that's eight possible combinations. Um, if you add four pixels, uh, then you have uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, all the way to uh, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, OK? And if you do this counting, you get, again, uh, 2 to the 4 possibilities, OK? Now, if you keep doing this, you will uh, find that um, the number of pixels uh, or the number of possible pictures you can take is uh, 2 to the L by L if on, for an L by L. Uh, uh, CCD, let's say, or, or a camera with L by L pixels. So the number is really big. It's a space that grows exponentially with this uh, number of pixels in the camera. So this, uh, um, this is uh, the size, if you want, or the number of pictures you can take with uh, with one camera. Okay, so um, so that's really big. Like for instance, for twenty eight by twenty eight uh, binary images, this number is uh, ten to 236, which is bigger than the number of atoms in the universe. Um, luckily, though, uh, most of these images are, are noise to our eyes, right? Like, so only a tiny fraction of this uh, huge space corresponds to uh, meaningful images. So images that our brain uh, understand, uh, they live, I mean, people in machine learning say these images that we understand live on a low dimensional manifold of these big spaces, which I illustrate here. So here we have a three dimensional space that is uh, representing this enormous 10 to 236 uh, dimensional space where uh, most of the images are uh, noise. Uh, but then there's a low dimensional manifold, which I represent here in blue in this line where like we find this uh, like meaningful images that we're interested in uh, studying, right? And the same is true in physics, right? Like, so we're interested in, um, in, in say, statistical mechanic models defined, for instance, uh, on uh, binary variables sigma i, which we call spins. They can take values uh, either uh, plus or minus one and so on. And um, they are defined usually in two or three dimensions. So here I have an example in two dimensions uh, uh, where you have a lattice of uh, this uh, spins on an L by L uh, lattice. So if you do the same counting, then you find that the, the size of the state space of uh, all possible configurations of this uh, two-body system or of this uh, two-dimensional system uh, is also growing exponentially. So same as binary images. Uh, so there are differences. Of course, here we have physical laws, like uh, we can compute the energy of these configurations. For instance, uh, we have here the energy of the so-called Ising model. And um, but uh, what I want to highlight here is that both uh, machine learning systems and systems of interest in uh, statistical mechanics and quantum physics share this high dimensionality that people in machine learning call the curse of dimensionality. Uh, so that's the first uh, commonality. The second commonality is the mathematical objects that we study. 
So uh, here I have the example of uh, unsupervised learning, where, for instance, researchers are interested in understanding the underlying probability um, of, uh, say, a data set, such as the handwritten digits. So you can ask, what's the probability of finding uh, an image that looks like this eight? Or what is the probability of finding an eight that looks more like uh, like this one here? So the one on the left, you would uh, guess it has lower probability because um, it's really uh, uh, badly written eight, whereas this one, which is more like a traditional number eight, would be assigned a higher probability. And so uh, people in computer, uh, computer vision and machine learning are interested in understanding this uh, probability distributions, OK? And this has some sort of uh, interesting applications like sampling and uh, anomaly detection and so on. It turns out that um, in physics or in statistical mechanics, we're also interested in, in the equilibrium properties of, uh, of this uh, physical systems. And, and we're interested in exactly the same distribution, right? Like what's the probability of uh, some given configuration um, uh, of uh, the spin uh, variables, which is if you want in, um, uh, I mean, they're exactly the same uh, object uh, as in, in machine learning, except we have, uh, if you want, a theoretical uh, model for what this distribution should be, which is the so-called Boltzmann distribution. But, um, but in, uh, like as a summary, like these objects are basically uh, the same, right? Like machine learning and statistical uh, physicists and uh, even quantum many body physicists are interested in in these high dimensional distributions and. Uh, also uh, wave functions, which are the descriptions of quantum many body systems. Um, the other example or important ingredient is uh, our commonality is the correlations and symmetries, which have strikingly uh, similar structure both in, in physics and in, uh, in machine learning. So a prominent example I really like is uh, critical correlations. So natural languages, uh, natural images, music, um, uh, flocking birds and uh, flocking animals, uh, all, of we, all those systems exhibit uh, power law decaying correlations, which are identical to a uh, classical or quantum many bar system when uh, tuned at, at critical point. Uh, cr by critical point, I mean, um, for instance, if you take uh, water and you boil it, there's a critical point at which the water goes from liquid, uh, liquid to a gas, and the system, this. Uh, it develops this uh, special uh, correlations uh, um, that, uh, this, that are characteristic of a uh, system uh, exhibiting critical behavior, a phase transition between phase A and phase B, or between a liquid and a gas, or a solid and a liquid. Um, so that's one important uh, uh, commonality. And the other one is symmetry. Symmetries with uh, which are have which are very very similar structure. For instance, translational symmetry is very important in condensed matter and statistical physics. Rotational symmetry, reflection, and other symmetries. And these symmetries, uh, at the same time, they enrich our understanding of uh, physical systems. But at the same time, they also um, uh, help us improve the computational complexity and the convergence of machine learning algorithms. Uh, such as like when you're doing computer vision or uh, natural language processing. So we're exploiting the same uh, structure. And uh, so um, that's, uh, we think it's important. So, so those are, if you want, the main commonalities. There are more, but um, those are the ones that I would like to highlight today. And now let me go on and tell you a couple of examples of uh, uh, how people are applying uh, machine learning to, uh, to uh, statistical mechanics and uh, quantum many body systems. So, the first, the first one, which is the one we came up with, uh, I think three or four years ago, was classifying phases of matter, like pretty much like how you do it um, in, uh, like uh, when you're trying to classify handwritten digits. Okay, so here we have a system. It's called uh, the Ising ferromagnet in two dimensions, where you have some energy function uh, uh, given by this uh, sum over the. In interaction between sigma i and sigma j where sigma and sigma j are the neighboring of um, like the neighbors of certain spin i uh, so you have this uh, energy function such that if you are at low temperature this uh, uh, spins tend to be aligned either up uh, or down and when you're at high temperature then they tend to be completely uh, random and the so-called a paramagnet in between there's a transition which is uh, uh, finite temperature phase transition between this uh, so-called ferromagnet and a high temperature phase, which is, the, is called uh, completely random spins or a paramagnet. And so what we did was uh, we studied this uh, phase transition using machine learning, right? Like, so where you go from a, a, 
a ferromagnetic phase to a paramagnetic phase. And we did it like uh, using basically uh, inspiration from this handwritten uh, digit classification of uh, MNIST, where you take this um, handwritten digits and then you understand a five as a perfect one plus some fluctuations, pretty much the same way we understand uh, a phase of matter using, say, mean field cartoon of what the phase looks like, which is this equivalent of this uh, perfect five plus some fluctuations induced by uh, uh, thermal uh, effects. And so what we did, we took, we took configurations uh, drawn from that uh, probability distribution given by the Boltzmann weight at different temperatures, and then we tried to classify them according to whether they looked like uh, they were coming from a ferromagnetic phase or from a paramagnetic phase. And that was uh, published in, in Nature Physics uh, already more than three years ago. Uh, so this is uh, how this data sets uh, look like. You have uh, two um, magnetically ordered uh, clusters, and then you have some high temperature um, disorder uh, cluster. Um, and then so then you can try to uh, classify those. And then what we found is that uh, this neural nets get pretty good as you train them at recognizing this uh, phases of matter. This either disorder or uh, order phases. And out of that, you can even get uh, uh, critical exponents that you can traditionally get through uh, simulations and uh, say using quantum, Mon uh, sorry, uh, Monte Carlo, Markov chain Monte Carlo and so on. If you, uh, but it turns out the neural network is also able to, uh, to, to extract this uh, uh, critical exponents and so on. There's, there's also some interesting generalization properties such as, um, for instance, if you train a model on a, a square lattice, then you can use the same model to check for the critical point of um, of a triangular lattice or a, even a honeycomb lattice and so on, and uh, without doing any more retraining. So, for instance, here I have an example where we train on the square lattice and then we test on the triangular lattice, and the same neural network uh, is able to, if you want, to determine the critical temperature of the of the triangular lattice, which we will find uh, like inspiring. I mean, this, this powerful generalization. Um, so that was uh, interesting and was one of the first examples. Uh, the other uh, example that I wanted to mm, discuss is uh, neural network uh, quantum states, which is the idea that you can uh, write down uh, a wave function in terms of uh, parameterized at the neural network. OK, and um, so uh, at the time, like in 2016 and 2017, we thought this was very novel and so on. But then as we uh, started reading and digging into literature, we found that uh, people were already thinking about this uh, a long time ago in, 19, in the 1990s, late 1990s. So there's this very interesting paper where they do exactly that, right? Like they solve or they use artificial neural networks in quantum mechanics. And so they find solutions for the two-dimensional Schrodinger equation, um, as you see here, using just a feedforward uh, neural network. So that was, if you want, as far as I understand, the first uh, neural network uh, quantum state that, uh, that was ever um, uh, discussed in the literature. Uh, and so it's surprising that uh, this uh, research happened during the uh, AI winter, actually. So this is in the mid 90s, uh, where uh, neural net nets and so on were not uh, so popular in the um, um, in the AI community because there was this AI winter happening. Um, however, <clears throat> when I was uh, as a postdoc at Perimeter Institute, we kind of like revived this thing. We uh, were able to write down. Um, the ground state of uh, a model called Kitaev's uh, toric code uh, using convolutional neural nets, which was uh, for us um, kind of like a breakthrough. Break breakthrough right now it looks more like a rediscovery of this paper. Um, but what we were able to do is we were able to analytically solve this model uh, using uh, neural nets, uh, basically a convolutional neural network with a very simple structure uh, with uh, non-linearities given by actually perceptrons. So it's a very simple model, but a very interesting wave function that we found, um, which was inspired by a construction based on uh, um, uh, uh, tensor networks. Okay, I guess the most uh, influential paper along this line is this uh, problem, uh, this paper where like uh, they solve or quote unquote solve the quantum anybody problem with uh, artificial neural networks. 
Uh, this was by uh, Carleo and Troyer in 2017 again, where they used this uh, so-called restricted Boltzmann machine uh, to numerically solve uh, ground states of uh, many body Hamiltonians and to study uh, unitary dynamics. And this was, if you want, the paper that um, uh, motivated a lot of people to look into this type of uh, many body wave functions through the lens of uh, artificial neural networks. Um, uh, that, so that's, uh, again, um, one more example of uh, using machine learning. Uh, the other one that I want to discuss is uh, there's a, a lot of work happening where you use machine learning to accelerate Markov chain Monte Carlo simulations in very complicated uh, uh, scenarios. So here is, for instance, um, sampling the configuration space of uh, proteins it was published recently or not so recently last year in Science. So it, it's, it's got a lot of... Um, interest uh, and it captured the attention of the community, but the idea was born also in the condensed matter uh, community. And the idea here in this example is you have um, a so-called Boltzmann generator. And the idea is you sample from a simple uh, latent distribution, uh, P of Z, and then you use an invertible deep neural network, which is represented here in red and blue. Um, and this uh, neural network is trained such that when you do this transformation, you, you end up with a distribution Px that approximates the desired uh, Boltzmann distribution e to the minus uh, beta u of x, which is this um, Boltzmann distribution uh, where this energy comes from the configurational space of um, very challenging uh, protein, sol uh, protein uh, models, okay? So these are very difficult to sample. And what they show is that uh, by using or by training this model Px, which is parameterized by this uh, invariable neural nets, you can uh, then compute uh, quantities of practical interest in um, by reweighting uh, the Boltzmann distribution by reweighting the sample you get out of this distribution px which is uh, parameterized by these invariable neural nets uh, and um, and so by doing that the, the uh, these researchers were able to sample really complicated distributions that are important for uh, molecular systems as well as quantum systems so this is very exciting and there's a lot of work happening along these lines um, the other or the final thing that i'd like to discuss is um, uh, so when we published this paper in 2017, we we thought about uh, two or three possible things we could do. So one is analyzing uh, high volumes of uh, numerical uh, simulation data. And that's kind of like how we um, went ahead and published our paper. But what we had in mind where we thought this could be a lot more powerful is in the analysis of experimental data. And then uh, certainly it happened, right? Like so this, and I have two examples. So here we have, um, uh, paper from last year where they identified quantum phase transitions using um, artificial uh, neural networks on experimental data, which is uh, data coming out of uh, uh, cold atom simulation. And what they do is they did pretty much this uh, same idea that we introduced in our paper, and then they just attempt to classify different phases but directly on experimental data, and then they certainly find this phase transitions. And what they say is that um, our results or their results point the way to unravel complex phase diagrams of experimental systems, uh, even where the Hamiltonian and the order parameters may not be known. So that was very exciting. Uh, and this is also uh, recent or from last year where they do uh, uh, machine learning and electronics uh, quantum matter imaging experiments. So they uh, go ahead and image uh, electronic quantum matter. And then uh, what they do is they train a set of uh, or a neural network based on uh, theoretical models that they came up with. And then, so this neural net is able to recognize, uh, if you want, theories. And, and so what happens is uh, they just uh, train this model on theoretical images, and then they use the experimental data as a test set uh, as a means to uh, identify what's the best theory um, uh, description of this images uh, could be. And so by doing that, they, uh, identify uh, physical mechanisms or hypothesis testing um, uh, through artificial neural nets. And so that was published in Nature last year, so it was very interesting. And um, uh, so with this, let me uh, conclude. I think I uh, provided uh, some examples uh, which demonstrate that uh, modern machine learning techniques 
um, have started to spread through the landscape of uh, quantum matter and strongly correlated systems research. I think there are lots of uh, opportunities that machine learning techniques, ideas, and this I want to emphasize that the research uh, culture in, in computer vision and in machine learning uh, can influence or can spark uh, ideas in the field of uh, quantum physics. Um, I think it's a privileged time for uh, people doing research in machine learning, quantum systems, uh, due to the enormous opportunities uh, arising from ideas in artificial intelligence, but also quantum computing, uh, which are, if you want, two of today's most uh, promising quantum paradigms, right? Like, or promising computing paradigms, which are, uh, if you want, changing and spreading uh, through all different sciences. And with that, I'd like to conclude and uh, thank again, uh, Amir, uh, for the invitation. Definitely. Thank you so much, Juan. Uh, as always, very interesting and engaging. Uh, so I have a list of questions to go through with you, um, which are mostly you know things that you covered, uh, but I'm interested to get a little deeper each of them. So let's, if you go back to the very beginning, you talked about, like in paper, you talked about several reasons why uh, essentially uh, condensed matter physics and machine learning have similarities, one of which is high dimensionality, which you know you demonstrated very clearly with your examples. Um, so I guess just to step back and help everyone understand to be on the same page, why is machine learning good at dealing with high dimensional problems? Um. Yeah, so why it's so it's almost a mystery, I think, uh, but I mean, it has to do with the fact that um, uh, I mean, that there's a lot of uh, structure in this problem, right? Like, so if uh, the data sets that we uh, use uh, would uh, not have this uh, structure, they, they wouldn't live in this low dimensional manifold, uh, this big spaces, then I think there would be hope for efficient machine learning uh, algorithms. So the first thing is the systems have a lot of structure. And the um, uh, second thing is uh, through experimentation and through compute and through data, we uh, people have discovered that um, neural nets and uh, these models have, uh, if you want, a, a good uh, inductive bias, meaning that uh, these models that people use, neural nets, convolutional neural nets, and uh, recurrent neural nets, uh, are good at uh, identifying this low dimensional manifold, okay? And I think that's the reason why this um, uh, why these algorithms are so successful, right? Like it was through uh, experimentation and discovery that uh, people uh, um, and intuition. Sorry, I missed that. Like intuition coming out of uh, domain knowledge, uh, people acquire about this data that uh, people uh, found or uh, reason about like how to uh, design uh, uh, neural network architectures that are suitable uh, for discovering or for working uh, effectively within this low dimensional manifolds. I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think that, that like whenever I, I think about this problem, uh, I'd like to go back to a session that we did like probably two years ago at this point, which uses Riemannian geometry to talk about how essentially going through a neural network is like doing manifold transformations. And every time uh, you you use the inherent data, sorry, the inherent symmetries in your data set to go to a slightly lower dimensional space. And eventually you, you end up on a very low dimensional space where your data actually exists. And all of the other dimensions that you started from uh, are things that you didn't necessarily need. Uh, like there are all those dimensions that you you you, you don't need to use to explain your data set, uh, the distribution of your data set, like, like what you said in, in the presentation as well. Yeah, that's right. I think the best, um, like the ultimate tool to understand this is definitely uh, information geometry. And um, if you want, that's where like things become become clearer, but uh, a simpler cartoon is this, just this low dimensional uh, space where like this data lives. And uh, I really like that idea, yeah. Definitely. Okay, and the, the second thing that you talked about is uh, 
you know, essentially in a lot of physics problems, condensed matter problems, what we are doing is probably probability estimations. And that's very similar to what we do in a lot of machine learning problems. Yeah. Uh, so again, like same question, can you just briefly talk about why, why is machine learning good at uh, estimating probability distributions? And I know in physics, usually we, we do that with sampling, uh, but you know, we, we don't necessarily always have the most efficient ways to sample. So is that, is that what you're solving here with machine learning? So, uh, so machine learning is uh, good uh, at uh, computing these distributions for the same reasons, right? Like because um, you you have a model that uh, has a uh, few parameters. I mean, by few, I mean few compared to the size of this dimensional space. Because I mean, you have these models with billions of parameters and so on. So you you may wonder, well, these are millions of parameters, right? Like so, this is not a few parameters. But when when I say few, it is compared to the size of this state space, which is gigantic, right? So let me use the word, like we use this model with few parameters and in machine learning and these machine learning models are good again at doing, at capturing those distributions with few parameters because precisely this data lives in this lower dimensional manifold and what we, uh, or people in machine learning do, or what we do is we exploit that uh, structure to come up with models that work uh, really well. Uh, and so then uh, estimating this probability is one thing we can do, but then sampling is the other thing we can do. And uh, people uh, have come up with uh, really amazing algorithms to say sample from these distributions or from uh, creating new samples that look as if they came from the same distribution and so on. Um, so that's one thing. And, and in physics, what we do is, okay, so in physics, the problem is a little bit different but um, we have this, this distribution and we know what it is, right? Like uh, the problem is in physics, we don't know how to sample this distribution very well. And the other thing we don't know is we don't know how to estimate this quantity uh, Z, which is the, if you want the normalization constant or the so-called partition function. And so in, in physics, the problem is, can we uh, get accurate uh, samples from this distribution or can we approximate this distribution by a, a different model um, and can we then uh, use these uh, models to compute quantities of interest um, in, in uh, statistical mechanics or in quantum many body systems? And so the commonality is we are interested in the same distribution or the same type of distributions, and but for different reasons, right? Like, so one is because we want to compute and understand uh, the behavior of the systems, and then the other one because we find interesting applications from this distribution. and. Um, the reason we can do it with machine learning is because, uh, again, there's a uh, structure in the problem. There's uh, low dimensionality or implicit low dimensionality. Mm. I don't know yeah. if I answered, but yeah. Yes, 100%. Uh, and I guess a question that I wanted to ask later, but maybe uh, it is good to, to bring it up since you, uh, since you talked about uh, the sort of low dimensionality of the problems is, is the is the common factor for both of these things being uh, effective. Uh, so, and, and symmetry is a big part of it. Uh, and so what, what I'm wondering is if we can get inspired from how machine learning methods solve these problems to figure out if there are symmetries or any other properties uh, that we are not exactly thinking about in physical systems. Uh, when we're trying to, for example, estimate what Z is? Yes, so that's a great question. And I think it's an active uh, research area. So there's a few uh, new papers where uh, people use uh, machine learning and uh, neural networks to discover symmetry, okay, in a physical system. I think we're not at the stage where uh, machine learning has discovered the new symmetry that we didn't anticipate, but I think uh, things are going in that direction. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, although I don't know of an example where, um, I mean, I know examples where machine learning discovered something we didn't know, but not specifically a symmetry. Right, right. Okay, cool. Uh, and the next point you made was uh, machine learning methods are good at uh, identifying critical behavior. Um, an example, like a few examples were natural language, music, uh, images, etc. Mm -hmm. And you talked about how correlation in these type of data sets 
uh, fall, uh, did you say exponentially or power law? The power law, yeah. Power law, right. Uh, and can, can you explain that a little more? Like what, what correlation are we talking about there? Yeah, so like, for instance, when you take a system, uh, like a spin system at a critical point, and then you correlate the behavior of uh, the, uh, like what's the probability say of uh, spin is up uh, as you, uh, sorry, given that one spin is up, what's the probability that at a distant uh, spin is also up, right? That's one correlation that is well-defined for this uh, spin systems and, um, uh, what you find is that this, uh, on average, this decays with the power law uh, for critical systems. So you can do the same for uh, natural images, for instance, right? Like images that you see, like uh, leaves, and I think this has been tested experimentally with uh, natural images, like uh, uh, leaves in a forest and so on. And if you compute the same correlation, you would find this uh, uh, scaling variance, right? Like this fact that this. Um, um, pixel pixel correlations decay as a power law okay and uh um you kind of like uh see why right like because if you take um in an image on average uh if uh the the number of pixels is high enough uh if you take two nearby pixels they're very likely that they're gonna be in the same uh state right because uh, I don't know, for instance, in an image of an eight, if you take a black pixel, there's a high probability that the pixel nearby is also black, right? Yeah. But as you go away, then uh, there's gonna, this is gonna change and there's gonna be the correlation. If you take an average over all possible uh, images uh, uh, on a data set, then you, for natural images, what you find is that these correlations decay again with the power law. And, um, right. I think the reason for this is a, a little bit uh, from mystery to me, but I think that ultimately what happens is that, um, I mean, natural images are also physical processes, right? Like this uh, writing and the natural images, what we see is uh, they're captured using, uh, I mean, there arises a physical process, right? Like they, they're, they're happening in the real world. And then on top of that, we have the camera, which is taking, um, the spectrums through a uh, physical process, right? Light coming to a to a light detector. So I think as ultimately because uh, these commonalities arise because we're interested in physical systems in the end, right. and these physical systems affect the data sets we create. You know, right, right, interesting. So if I if I sort of want to repeat what you said to to test my understanding, what you're saying is that say in case of images what we are dealing with, like we are talking about natural images, like these are not made up images. That's so right. uh, images of objects and objects normally have continuity, which means that they span, like if you're looking at image of a number eight or image of a cop or etc., they have some continuity over the pixels. And if we look for a value of a certain pixel and how it changes over the neighboring pixels, there should be some continuity, like the value is not going to go from black to white all of a sudden, and then to gray all of a sudden, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the reason, yeah. that's essentially the, the correlation that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and in natural language, probably also the, like, I guess that's the fundamental of all language models, that the, the likelihood of words uh, that are tokens happening close to each other uh, for certain words are higher than other words. Like yeah, if I exactly. Have, you know, England in a sentence, it's very likely to have London closer to it than Paris, et cetera, et cetera. So, and that kind of correlation, uh, you're saying that it's shown that follows a power law. That's exactly what I'm saying. And uh, this has been checked in experiments. Right, right. And in comparison, like if you, if you think about pictures that are not, I guess, you know, in, in your words, physical or natural, uh, like a like an image of, you know, completely random black and white pixels. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. the correlation in, in a system like that would probably be a delta function. So it doesn't. Yeah, it is a delta function. function. Exactly. OK, very interesting. Cool. Uh, so and and uh, and generally speaking, machine learning models are 
good at mapping out that kind of correlation. Uh, is that the intuition that, that we're using machine learning for these now? Yeah, that's, uh, I think, what I was trying to argue, right? That um, machine learning is good at detecting uh, or um, working with data that exhibit uh, correlations that have a lot of structure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Interesting. OK, so and then uh, let's move on to your first example. In, in the first one, you talked about uh, Ising model. And one of the things that was a little striking for me uh, was the fact that you mentioned how you train the model on, on a square lattice, and then the performance on a, on a triangular lattice was almost as good without retraining. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's a remarkable generalizability that is happening there. Do you, yeah. have, do you have some intuition for why it is generalizing so well? Yes, yeah, so this happens because, uh, uh, so when we study the systems uh, and these phase transitions, uh, we, uh, like when we're doing uh, this calculation, like uh, like as, as we were trained as uh, physicists, like in the usual sense, we, we study these transitions through something called uh, uh, order parameter, which measures, if you want, the degree of uh, order, right? Like, so for instance, for this transition, uh, we use the expectation value of the average of the average over the different uh, spins in the system. Okay, so that's how we do it in in practice and and like when we're not using machine learning. And it turns out when we, that when you do the machine learning and you open the black box of the neural net, what the neural net is doing is actually computing the magnetization, the order parameter. Okay. And so if you have a machine learning uh, model that you know it's computing the order parameter, then uh, this is going to generalize to any phase transition with the same order parameter, right? And so what we did was we trained on the square lattice, and this uh, produces a model that uh, learns how to read the order parameter without you telling it, right? And so when you go and you try it on the triangular lattice, uh, it turns out this phase transition on the triangular lattice is also uh, described by the same critical theory, meaning that it uses the same order parameter as in the square lattice. And so that's why it works, right? Like, and it, that's why uh, the same idea, exactly the same model works. And it's even more striking. You can even change dimensionality, right? You can go from 2D uh, system uh, to a 3D one, and, it's, and it works, right? Like, as long as it has the same order parameter. And, and so we tested that idea, and it works also on, on 3D, even if you train it in 2D. Very interesting. So <clears throat> maybe to help me understand a little better, uh, can you tell me a little more about the training? Like, what are you, like, you're not training it to learn the order parameter. It's just emergent phenomena that it just learns. Uh, yeah, order, exactly. Right? So what, what's, what's happening in training? Like, what's the data that is going in? And are you, is it supervised training? Like It is. So it, what we did was it is supervised learning. So what we did was we, uh, we took a data set and like we took, say, a data at low temperature samples from this Boltzmann, Boltzmann distribution somewhere here. So 20K samples below TC and then 20K uh, samples above TC. They, so uh, below TC, they look like uh, this here, like what I'm uh, pointing with the mouse. And what it looks like when you're in high temperature, it looks like this. And then you say, okay, I'm gonna find the classifier that distinguishes between these guys and these guys, okay? <laughs> and so when you do that, uh, what you end up with is a, uh, a function. I mean, your neural network is a function. Yeah. Um, and then uh, this function is in principle, a function of the configurations X, okay? And I called X this um, uh, images that you see here. Yep. It, it turns out this function, uh, as you train it, it becomes a function not directly of x, but a function of the magnetization of x. Okay, and we we check this we check this numerically, right? right. Uh, I don't, uh, and uh, when we do that, then uh, it's clear that the neural net is using this concept that we know from physics, the so-called magnetization, to decide to to decide, right? Um, mm. Uh, to make this decision between whether uh, this image looks like uh, as a ferromagnet or as a paramagnet. And then once you find that this neural net created that function, then you can uh, use it in any dimension or for any system. 
in right. uh, di different lattices and so on. And uh, and it's because uh, we uh, checked that, and we even came up with analytical uh, models or analytical neural networks that yeah. uh, do this classification perfectly. Very cool. Uh, just I didn't have time to explain. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's that's very very interesting. So just just to recap what you said and. Uh, Essentially, what you're saying is that you grabbed a bunch of examples of systems that are more ordered. Uh, so those are the images you're showing on the top. Uh, and images that are, sorry, not images, like the spin systems look like images here. Uh, and the spin systems that are more random, like the ones that you show at the bottom. And mm -hmm. these are two different phases of matter uh, that you know from condensed matter physics. Uh, and you just fed these into the system and told the system these are below critical temperature and these are above critical temperature and just- Yeah, that's the label if you want. Yeah. Exactly, and then you did classification uh, and then the system just learned the order parameter on its own, which is quite interesting. That's exactly right. what happened, yeah. <laughs> Remarkable. Uh, so let's move on to, sorry, and this was a feed forward network you said. This are feed forwards, pretty much uh, uh, what you, the first machine learning algorithm. So it turns out I was, so when I was doing this thing, I was actually learning uh, how to do digit classification. Right. So right. I took the simplest neural net for MNIST, which is uh, 28 by 28, blah, blah, blah. And then what I did is I took exactly the same 28 by 28 images yeah. uh, <laughs> from spin configuration from a simulation I ran. And then this is right. how I learned how to classify. <laughs> All right, I published the paper, I guess. In uh, <laughs> and uh, and the next thing was uh, estimating quantum states using uh, uh, using neural nets. Um, and you you talked about I, I remember probably fifteen years ago when I was doing my masters, I was playing with the matrix product states, mm -hmm. which I think are are a specific kind of tensor networks. Uh, Oh, uh, is that a tensor network? Yeah, I think. yeah, that's a tensor yeah. network. Right, uh, and and is that sort of the idea that you're you're using here to reconstruct quantum states? It's very similar, exactly. So in uh, so the idea is that in tensor networks you have uh, parameterization of the quantum state um, written as a product of uh, a big bunch of tensors, right? And this with that you can construct a, a state, a quantum state. And then you optimize it, or you time evolve it. You can do anything you want with it, or you can try to do many things. And the idea here is the same, but instead of using a tensor network, you're using a neural network, uh, which is also a parameterized function. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea is then you instead of parameterizing, say, a classifier or a conditional distribution, which tells you this digit looks like A or B, you can uh, output the amplitude of the wave function or the normalized output or the normalized one. So here the output is just one number, a complex number, as, uh, and, uh, and then you can uh, say optimize the parameters in the neural net such that this uh, amplitude looks like the wave function of a quantum system. I'm is sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I needed to answer my door. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm working at home. Uh, okay, awesome. Uh, sorry, I missed the, your answer, but I'm gonna go back and watch it later. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the next thing was uh, acceleration of Monte Carlo, uh, and in that case, we like for those who are not familiar, we use Monte Carlo to estimate probability distributions, uh, and we have a quantum version of that. And here you're talking about uh, using machine learning to accelerate the quantum Monte Carlo. If you want to just very quickly recap, uh, can you tell me what, what's the intuition why machine learning is, uh, is better, is faster at uh, estimating this distribution? Yeah, so I can, so this was not in quantum Monte Carlo, this was in okay. classical Monte Carlo for uh, pro, uh, studying proteins. Okay. So the idea and the challenge here is, um, so when you sample this Boltzmann distribution directly with uh, Monte Carlo without machine learning, what happens is that you usually end up visiting uh, points that uh, look 
like um, that are high probable, right? Like uh, like this point here that I'm trying to uh, point with uh, my pointer. Um, and then if you do uh, traditional Mont Monte Carlo, then you would be stuck here, and you would be missing, for, for instance, this um, this modes in the distribution because uh, hopping from this uh, configure this point in the configuration space to this one. Um, happens through a series of moves that mm, make it uh, very unlikely that you would visit this mode in the distribution. Okay, and so what what's cool about this approach is that you're sampling from a probability distribution PZ that is uh, very simple to sample. It's a latent distribution like a Gaussian, so it's easy to sample. And then you transform this sample is completely independent, and then you um, you get a, an exact sample of from that distribution px and what you do is you train uh, px such that um, it looks very similar to this original Boltzmann uh, distribution okay and so you you have uh, some um, like you have the possibility to sample uh, very complicated uh, distributions since this model uh, 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 doesn't have the drawbacks of sampling this distribution which uses Markov chains so the sampling this distribution is exact it's uh, one of those uh, sort of like normalizing flow distributions, so you can get exact samples easily. And then, so if you train this model uh, well enough, then you will uh, produce samples that are almost independent uh, once you apply this reweighting step, uh, which um, ultimately uh, makes X be distributed according to the Boltzmann distribution. So in the end, what you uh, what you do is you uh, instead of just doing bare Markov chain Monte Carlo, you supplement that with um, an approximate distribution out of which you can get exact samples. And by reweighting this uh, exact samples you get from that distribution, then you end up sampling this distribution uh, in a much uh, more efficient way uh, with respect to uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo directly on this uh, challenging, challenging distribution. Mm -hmm. That's like. Uh, kind of like a quick summary of right, uh, right. what I was saying. It's very interesting. All right. And the next item was using uh, machine learning to uh, analyze experimental data. Yeah. Uh, so that one is kind of interesting because normally when we do experiments, what we are trying to do in physics is probing particular theories that we have. So we have a theory, it has some parameters. We are interested to learn those parameters. We do experiments, take data, and then use that data to estimate the particular parameter. Yeah. Uh, so if if that's the case, we already have a model, uh, why would we need machine learning? Because can't we just fit to that model and uh, did use the parameter that we're interested in? Yeah, so uh, it's a, uh, I think that is one approach. Uh, if you want that, could be done, right? Uh, but they, the authors in this paper, they took a different approach that um, if you want is, um, um, if you want faster from the data point of view, as far as I understood this paper, right? Like, so what they do is they, uh, uh, and that is less susceptible to noise, right? Like, uh, because uh, these models they uh, use can be suscept more susceptible to noise. So what they claim, or if I remember correctly, is that this is more robust to um, uh, to the noise they see, right? Like, and then this is faster in terms of um, the volume of data that they use. But I agree that uh, the point you're raising is fair, and this could be done as well. And I wouldn't know. Uh, I wouldn't know how to answer whether this is better or worse than what you're proposing. But it's a fair question. Yeah, I mean, I, I wonder. I haven't looked at this work, uh, but I wonder if it has something to do with what you saw in your Eisen model case, where you know, without telling the system what to look for, it kind of figured out what to look for uh, based on the observation. Could, could that yes. could it be something like that? It could be, right? Like, because uh, we have, uh, I mean, they, they propose, say, four different models, right? And uh, we don't know, I mean, we have some understanding of the models, right? But uh, we don't know what the neural net is uh, um, is using to uh, 
to make this decision. So it could be that part, right? I think that's a very good point you're raising, that it could be that this neural net uh, kind of like makes sense out of this data in a different way than we do, such that deciding um, or resolving which is the most uh, predictive theory is more natural in this setting. So, but uh, but yeah, I, I don't have a very good answer to to that question. I mean, that was that was definitely great insight. Uh, so we are almost out of time. I'm I'm gonna ask the online folks to uh, put any questions you have in the chat, and I'll relay. Uh, and please do go to ai.science to create an account to get notified about events like this. We do these quite a few times every week. Um, but just to wrap it up, since we have a few minutes, uh, one thing as you know, as a as somebody who's trained as a physicist, I always like to think that uh, physics can and will affect how we think about machine learning. Uh, and since you're working in this overlap, and you know, pretty much your talk was uh, about the overlap of the two, uh, and and you talked a bit about how machine learning is affecting how we think about physics. But you know, what are you know, just maybe wrap. Let's wrap up the session by your thoughts on. How do you think physics is affecting how we're thinking about machine learning? Um, so there's a, a lot of uh, research being done uh, in that direction, right? Like that I'm not touching upon, right? Like so, uh, so a lot of people trying to use uh, uh, statistical mechanics tools like theory of spin glasses and so on to try to understand how we um, how we train or how neural nets train and their convergence properties and their generalization, right? So that's really really fundamental and it's happening right like uh so i, I would say that's the most important uh as uh, if you want mm, uh, approach in that direction the other one that is more uh, subtle is as we study the systems we're learning about the machine learning models as well and about their inductive biases and so on uh, and that's a little bit more subtle uh, but i think this is going to be uh, helping um, interpretability in machine learning because we have we have a new lens or a new opportunity uh, to understand these models uh, through the lens of uh, quantum physics and statistical mechanics, right? And I think that's uh, underappreciated, but um, it is gaining more and more uh, momentum, I would say. And uh, you see, like this group uh, from Cornell, they have done a lot of interesting uh, work about opening these black boxes, right? And you learn. Um, uh, about how does neural nets behave by just using this data, right? And, and I think that's underappreciated and, and it's happening more and more. Um, and I think that's one uh, second thought. The other one is um, people have used uh, this idea of symmetry, gauge symmetries and so on, uh, that are ideas borrowed from uh, nuclear physics and uh, uh, spin systems uh, to define new models, like uh, this gauge, uh, convolutional neural networks and so on that can be used to, uh, if you want, make sense of um, the world that is not uh, two-dimensional or three-dimensional, right? Like, but, like the so-called geometric deep learning and so on. So I think they use a lot of tools from that were developed in physics and mathematics. And I think that's uh, yet another direction. Um, and there are more, but those three are the ones that come to my mind right now. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to see more of your research coming up and hopefully inviting you again to have a chat i always really enjoy our conversations uh, and looking forward to your future work thank, thank you again you for taking the time to speak with us uh, and uh, yeah audience thank you so much again for being with us today uh, and make sure you go to ai.science and create an account to get notified about these and also subscribe on uh, youtube uh, for future videos. Thank you. Thank you.